Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Herdmates Sodcast. Um, and today I'm very, very pleased to have Dr. Mark Kukazella joining us all the way from West Virginia. And Mark is a professor at West Virginia University School of Medicine. Correct. And recently retired Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Air Force. Thank you for your service. Um, but you were designing programs for troops at, in the Air Force. Is that correct? Yeah, so part of my career, toward the end of my career, was working with, um, and thank you, Peter, for having me on the show. You know, West Virginia, we're a very uh, farm-friendly state. You know, a lot of local farms, you know, whether it's uh, vegetables and farm markets or husbandry and animal products, um, we'd, we'd love here to support our local farmers. And I have a whole little circle of people that I barter. I, I'm in my shoe store right now. So if you hear a little background noise, I own a little shoe store. So what's one of the nice things about having a small retail is I can trade things for eggs and the you know sides of beef and things. So it's, how, it's many, whole, whole how many sneakers does it take to get a side of beef? That depends. So, you know, and I got like a I got a 40 pound um, ground beef supply. And I think I traded two pairs of shoes for that. So that's a pretty good deal, right? Yeah, so it yeah. was good grass-fed stuff, but they were good shoes. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Of course they would be. <laughs> but it was good, it was good beef. So yes. it's all good. Yes. So um, but you were saying that the, yeah, this so health and fitness my career, I was um I was always a, an athlete in the Air Force. I traveled around as a competitor for the Air Force. We have a, a team that travels to different countries and runs races. And I was a, a flight doc who was kind of very much into the sports medicine side of, you know, in military troops, the goal is to keep people healthy and, and help them pass the test. Because if, if people don't pass a fitness test, Peter, they're out of the military. So hmm. that's not a, a normal thing for a civilian job. Like if you went to my civilian hospital and they all had to line up tomorrow for a fitness test, it probably wouldn't go too well and we might lose half of our staff but every every time they they have a, a change right now there's an administration change right so everything will change and be turned upside down but new chief of staff would come on board every four to six years everyone would air their grievances and the fitness test was always a grievance because no one was content with the test that it was it was a run test when i first joined but then some people were dropping dead of heart attacks <laughs> so then they're like we don't want to kill people in the fitness test so then it became like a, a jane fonda yoga step test right like i'm kind of marching here like it's uh, you go up on those aerobic steps you know at a cadence and they check your pulse and try to assess your fitness and people didn't like that and then it became a bicycle test it was like a submax test and there's a lot of variance in how you interpret that to field fitness so then the new chief of staff comes on board about 2010 11 shakes up the fitness test makes it a run test again and the run test is now 60% of the score. And if you fail the run test, you're out of the Air Force. So all of a sudden, you know, running was actually pretty important. And, you know, I was like the, the running guy in, in the Air Force. So I, I, it was a nice opportunity. I got six months to go in and dig deep into why people were failing the test. You know, we all kind of come in with our own hypotheses. You know, why do people fail the test? You know, the common dogma, well, people just need to exercise more, right? They're a bunch of lazy troops. They need to get off their butt and do PT. Mm -hmm. But when I went into the data, that absolutely was not true. You know, the people that were not passing the test are doing the same PT, you know, but they're doing something wrong. But but one of the things I noticed immediately that was a correlator, Peter, was the BMI. You know, we didn't have the waist circumference data really you could look at. That's so irregular in how people measure that. But the BMI was something we could track. And if your BMI was high, your odds of failing the test were high. And it shouldn't be too surprising out there to anyone listening who has tried to run a mile and a half carrying 50 pounds on their belly or on their back, you know, like mm -hmm. a rucksack. So that got me into the obesity space. And I realized really quick, I didn't know a damn thing about obesity. Okay. And as I recall from some of your pre presentations, as you worked in that space, you became aware of something in yourself as well. Yeah, it was kind of, you know, when you have time to step away from your job and the stress and the patterns you're in. And, and uh, so I had to get my own military physical every year. And, you know, they do all the standard blood tests, you know, I, I 
doc, dudes don't go to doctors, right? So I probably never would have gone to a doctor, right? People say, who's your doctor? You know, 45 year old guy, right? You know, unless I break my ankle, but I had a high fasting glucose at about 2012. And when I was on duty doing this um, assignment and uh, my A1C was a little above six and it was, you know, I looked like this, you know, I looked like a runner. And um, so it was kind of weird. a runner. <laughs> yeah, I was a runner. Um, so they did a test called, I, you know, I'm a family doc. I never ordered a C-peptide test on anybody, you know, so I had to look up kind of what, what that meant, but they ordered the C-peptide test and my value was 0.3, which was um, barely making enough insulin. And then I, I put on a CGM actually, because I was at an institution that had one that you could kind of check out just to, you know, you'd, you'd get the little uh, inserter and they had, had a little box that, that you would read it and you couldn't see it real time. It was just recording data. Um, and I just kind of went through a few days and then, you know, turn that back in and debrief the day. And I was like, wow, it makes sense now. Cause so I was, a, what, I was a runner eating the runner's diet, right. Which is like cereal and, you know, muffins and bagels and pasta. My sugar would go up, you know, 250 range, even higher, and then come crashing back down. And then you'd get like, I'd wake up every morning at two in the morning. I was like, had been about four or five years I was doing that now it's starting to make sense because I would get these reactive hypoglycemias you know so but I just kind of can't, you know chalked it off to well I guess I'm just exercising a lot that my body needs to eat every four hours yeah. so CGM uh, so, so, stands for uh, continuous glucose monitor okay and C peptide is... is a is a marker of insulin production from your pancreas so absolute zero would be a complete type one diabetic, you know, 100% reliant on insulin injections. Normal range is going to be, you know, five to 10 range, you know, so mine was, was well below that normal range. And so it kind of put me on the spectrum of, of insulin insufficiency, but the same rules apply to how to regulate your blood glucose, which, you know, I quickly realized, which was well, just don't eat the foods that raise your blood sugar. <laughs> so I, it was, but that was kind of almost heretical at the time to be a runner and eat eggs and steak because it's like, well, aren't you going to bonk or something? Yeah, I know I was to talking about load, right? fat adaptation or, you know, yeah. Volex work and Finney and ketogenic diets for athletes. Even though some of that work had been done, you know, it was kind of like hidden, you know, because it wasn't well accepted in the scientific community. And certainly Tim Noakes has talked about it, you know, in the industry of sports nutrition, you know, which is an industry, you know, between drinks and gels and goos. But, but at the same time, you know, when I started to read a bit about obesity, you know, the internet was flourishing then and you didn't have to go to the stacks of your medical library. You could just start searching things and you would follow links. And somehow, Peter, I came across that Gary Taub's article from the New York New York Times, you know, maybe it's all been a big fat lie. I'm not sure what link sent me to that, but I, I, I read it and I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Right. Just reading that, I was like, that, because I've witnessed the complete failure of obesity management, including how I was counseling people. Well, you just need to burn more, 500 more calories than you eat every day and you'll lose a pound a week. You know, it's simple math, you know, just count the calories, burn it. And maybe you'll go back to your original birth weight or something. You do that. <laughs> so um, I bought his book, um, which I'm sure you've read, you know, the first kind of tome, it's good calories, bad calories. And it's about 600 pages and or a thousand scientific re references. Read that like twice. And, you know, but again, like I wasn't convinced that, well, he's a scientific journalist, that all this was absolutely true. So you go and do the human experiment with the people. I mean, it made total biologic sense um you know the history of of obesity diabetes and the treatments but you know i couldn't pull up randomized trials at the time so i, I was i traveled to about 50 military bases that year teaching running really teaching how to pass the tests and i would be in a, a little base gym and none of them wanted to be there peter <laughs> because there was like mandatory briefing on passing the fitness test and how many military people like to run hmm. None. It'd be like the little one kid in the back who's like on the high school cross country team, you know, that everyone hates. Like, who likes to run? The, you know, little skinny kid in the back like these. Oh, I love running. And everyone's like, oh, F you, right? The big guy, you know, who, who could carry three of them off the battlefield. You know, but probably a lot of the reason they don't like to run is that they just pound their bodies every day, you know, and, and they're 
carrying so much weight and they're metabolically they're unhealthy becoming pre-diabetic but I, i'd ask this question you know because weight if, if you have a, a waist is another uh, do not pass go for military physical so everyone is worried about their waist circumference you know so when that starts getting big they start taking you know nutrition seriously in addition to their exercise but i'd ask has anyone in the room lost 50 pounds and kept it off you know for six months for a year you know, you maybe have a hundred people in a base gym and you'd have maybe one raise their hand, maybe a couple raise their hand, you know, a little reluctantly, but um, they're, you know, it's bro science. They all want to share what they do. And, and I'd ask, well, what did you do? And it was always a variant of the same. They'd say, well, I got rid of all the sugar, right? They'd say that, like all the soda, all the sweet drinks. I got rid of all the bread. Or they'd say paleo in 2012 was a, really like a low carb diet. There was no paleo processed you know, junk food, right? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of paleo crap out there with tons of carbohydrates right now. But back in the day, it was eat plants and animals. That was paleo. You'd kill it, fish for it, or you'd gather it. And, you know, it's hard to get simple sugars that way. And occasionally someone would, would have the guts <laughs> to, to say, because I was a doc, right? So they're like, should I say this? They'd say, well, I, I, you know, I did this thing called <laughs> Atkins, you know, mm -hmm. and they were ready to, their immediate doctor response would have been, well, that's going to give you a heart attack, right? So I'd say, oh, yeah, that really does work. <laughs> because, you know, the mm -hmm. Taubes' original article was about the Atkins diet. Mm -hmm. And, and, but that was, you know, after you've gone to like 50 places, I never once, you know, this is how we do nutritional epidemiology, right? We do retrospective survey studies and we call it hard science, you know, the food frequency questionnaire. Like, I have no idea what these people were actually doing. You know, they just said they were doing that and lost the weight. But um, yeah, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, fa it was fascinating and not once, not once. So this is my randomized trial retrospective. Did I have someone raise their hand and say, well, I've, I, doing the heart healthy, low fat diet. Mm -hmm. And up my exercise and- Yeah, up my exercise and I'm doing the AHA. They, they used to have a step two diet then. Do you know what the step two diet was? Mm -hmm. So if I your think... cholesterol was high, you'd go on a step one diet, which was 10% fat. And if that didn't work, you'd go on 7% fat, which was called the AHA step two diet. I, I really don't think it's still in their website, but like no. you would just, if. If it didn't work to begin with, you would double down and try, right. Let's just try do it harder, harder with what still doesn't work. I'm, I'm on that step three diet now, which is like Pritikin or something, which is, I mean, these are military people shopping at a commissary, you know, on an, an E2's income, right? They, they, I mean, an E2, enlisted two, which is great, you know, they're just fresh out of basic, you know, your majority of your troops are young enlisted. These people don't. I mean, they're ain't ma even making minimum wage, right? They, they sign up because of the benefits. They get housing, you know, they get medical, but they're, if you look at what their every two week take home pay is, by the time they pay off their fancy car that they shouldn't be driving, right? They'll get these nice cars and you're like, why are you doing that? But yeah, they don't have a lot of money for, for groceries, but the commissaries are great because you can get produce, you can get meat, you can get eggs for like dirt cheap you know, way cheaper than even like a Save-A-Lot or, a, you know, an Aldi store. Mm -hmm. One of the nice benefits about being in the military is you can get fresh, real food. Absolutely. And that leads me, well, first of all, you the, the first book, and forgive me if it's not your first, it's the first one I was aware of, was a book called Run for Your Life. Um, but you have a new book that's coming out uh, low carb for any budget. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't really call that a book. That's more of like a little print flyer, little mini book, like a, book sort of, a booklet that can be accessible to anyone, any place to try to, it's a patient friendly book, not geared to the doctors, but you know, I have in my clinic, you know, I'm always, I got all these printouts, right. And I'm like killing trees and then they're in a folder and you don't know. So I, I got a grant to put together all of this stuff in one little booklet. It's 50 pages and about 10 of the pages are simple recipes. You know, that uh, my good friend, uh, Christy Sullivan, she's one of the leads on the Diet Doctor kind of um, page for recipes and videos. You know, so you, you, you go to the experts because <laughs> I'm a dude. I just throw, you know, a piece of meat on a skillet and season it. But, you know, that's family yeah. dinner. They want a little more than that. So, so she has yeah. some great low cost, you know, Southern, you know, I'm in West Virginia. Like, what can you get at a dollar store? Because mm -hmm. 
I don't know what it's like in Western Oregon, but um, or Eastern Oregon. I'm sorry, where you, where you are. It's no, very Western. cool here. You're Western, yeah. okay. But yeah. in their food deserts, I, I think I heard, you know, you don't know what stat's totally true, but about 60% of our state does most of their grocery shopping in dollar stores. Because mm-hmm. there's yeah. it's an hour to any grocery store where they live. Yeah. Yeah. So they go to the dollar store. Yeah. And and we have one here in our, our little town in Western Oregon and uh, been impressed with what they try to stock. They seem to have a certain amount of autonomy that they can. Yeah, each um, store can make decisions based on supply and demand. So it's so we may get back to that idea because I think you've mentioned something about, um, well, you called it narrative medicine, but we're jumping way ahead here because um so you you were doing this work in the air force was it restricted to the air force or other branches well it's now public so i have a website called natural running center that um you can see it says a uh, u.s air force program so we built these video modules that people could watch you know we f- most of most of it's like interactive um like you go through slides but then it would click to a video so it's a three module course on on how to train and prepare yourself to pass the fitness test and and you had discovered that along the way you had discovered this about yourself through your own annual physical and then at some point you connected in with um dr bernstein's book um yeah powerful book i'm not sure exactly how because certainly like you could go you could probably ask endocrinologists how many have even heard of this guy. And um, I would probably say the ones I know who maybe even a little more savvy with low carb, maybe 50%, maybe less. Mm. So Dr. Richard Bernstein wrote the diabetes solution. So he's probably the only one alive who was diagnosed with type one in 1946 still going to the gym maybe a few are alive on dialysis but this guy's still still practicing medicine you know doing his uh youtube you know education seminars but it, it, he was an engineer and started to get all the complications of diabetes and back then there was no conti- there was no there wasn't even finger stick monitors and his wife was a doctor and and had a had a journal throwaway journal and uh Richard's uh, doc, Dr. B's looking through it and he sees this ad for a machine which would differentiate if you were drunk or hypoglycemic. It was called, you know, a glucometer and it was like a chemistry experiment. You know, the first model probably took 10 minutes of mixing things, but you'd get a glucose. So he started, he was the first person to start checking his glucose and immediately yeah. realized the food was the biggest factor in glucose control. And he was an engineer. He started making spreadsheets and presenting at scientific conferences. But he was discredited because he wasn't a doctor. So you know the story, but for the folks listening out there, so what do you think he did? He was like, he was 46. Yeah, he went to medical school and became an endocrinologist. (laughs) I love it. Uh, I love when engineers uh, get involved in medicine. It's it's the user manual for anyone Mm -hmm. with any type of diabetes. His initial works were focused on type one, but the same rules apply. You know, whether you're type one, you know, and, and it's the differentiation between people don't have just pure type one or type two. We have to look at them. Do they make insulin or are they making too much insulin? Mm. You know, are they insulin resistant or insulin sensitive? Meaning the insulin you make or inject, does it work? Or you're like, that's gentle knock on the door. Insulin works. Or is it you're fully resistant, meaning you're stuffing insulin into your system and you're banging at the door and it's not working. So we need to think of it clinically like that because what lever do you work on right do you work on the resistance lower the insulin work on yeah i mean there's it's like a grid mm-hmm. but you need a good if you have diabetes of any type find someone who understands how to truly tell you what your problem is you know measure so, an insulin uh, level okay and Just and one of, one of the laws um i believe from Dr. Bernstein is the law of small numbers. Is that right? Yeah. And it's an engineering principle, you know, small, it's a, any a principle of flight, you know, so small inputs lead to small changes. So he uses it with diabetes. So small doses of carbs lead to smaller 
doses of insulin or needs of insulin if you're a type two, which lead to more stable blood sugars, smaller changes in blood sugars, large doses of carbohydrates, large doses of insulin lead to very unstable sugars. Most patients with diabetes don't even realize, even people who've had it for 20 years, you know, you kind of want to just know what they understand at a first visit, you know, well, what does 10 grams of carbohydrates do to your blood sugar? And they look uh, like, they look at you like you got a little head tilt, like, well, what do you mean? Like, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, what's 10 gram of carbs? What's it do to your blood sugar? What does one unit of insulin do to your blood sugar? Mm -hmm. Is it lower at 20? Is it lower at 40? Because they're just shooting from the hip and they're mm -hmm. wondering why, but no one's really, it's, it's not their fault. I mean, they just need to understand how to self-assess it. Mm -hmm. And then like their homework is, I want you to come back and let me know in two weeks, what does 10 gram of carbohydrate do to your blood sugar? And what does one, if they're using insulin, what does one unit of insulin do to your blood sugar? And then we can start to sort it out. Mm -hmm. And then they become the leader of their own healthcare team, which is the goal. Because diabetes, they have to, man like I can't say take a baby aspirin a day, have a nice day, right? They're the most important person in the room. You know, I can't, you can't, the endocrinologist cannot manage someone's diabetes. Because you know, right. it's, a, it's a minute to minute. It's a, one of the most difficult things if they don't understand it. Now, if they do understand it, they feel empowered and aren't afraid of it anymore. We're, we're talking, we've been talking about diabetes. And yes, what, what we're talking about is actually a spectrum of conditions that show up as a many things, diabetes included, but um, obesity does not cause diabetes, right? Obesity. Yeah, they travel together. Exactly. Cause it. Yeah. And so does heart disease. And so apparently does Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And so does kidney disease and vision loss and all of these. Uh, but we they travel with the hyperinsulinemia and the insulin yes. resistance. Yes. In one so. degree or another manifesting whichever organ system you choose <laughs> it's going to be affected so i just think it's really good news because this is a lifestyle intervention that seems to um have a positive impact on so many chronic conditions um that is given the right information given the right coaching given the right um uh, opportunity, maybe even, um, we could make tremendous progress in improving people's health. You have a line on sort of a sub subtitle on the booklet, uh, begin a life of dieting, which we could talk about and indulge yourself in health. It was the indulge begin yourself in free of dieting. <laughs> oh, free. I'm sorry. There it is. Yeah, I missed yeah. the word free. Yeah. That's the key word, right? Because humans yeah. are not, you know, you're a under, you know, being working in husbandry and animals. I mean, there's evolutionary biology, you know, species are not designed to go on diets. Right. We used to call them semi-starvation diets. Yeah, maybe right? Yeah, some kind of purpose, if, I don't know, but yeah, live a life free of dieting. Yeah. Like people should not be on a diet. They need to, especially kids, you know, so like when kids are compelled, there was actually an article I just read today, it was in JAMA Peds about the negative impact of just a BMI focused pediatric obesity approach, which subtly leads to that teenager to go on a diet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Well, and yeah, we... Yeah, step back and like, okay, we're telling these 13-year-old girls who are already watching too much TV and media. I, I, don't, I don't know the better answer, but I want them to focus on health, right? So I want them to live a life free of dieting and indulge yourself in health. When people are healthy, that's addictive. Yeah, They're, but, that's but indulgence, that's, that's kind of sad that today that health would be seen as an indulgence as opposed to what should in at least in high income countries be an expectation right we 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 certainly have everything we need we just yeah. we don't have the information i think to access and make best use and there's and lots think, of things 
Yeah, the reason I think that word fits is because, like, if you look out there at the health culture, you know, you got to, like, restrict calories and exercise mm. till you're going to puke. Mm. And then you're going to be healthy. Eat lots you know, of plants. Fit, but not healthy. Yeah, you're going to be, like, uber fit, but, you know, you're wrecking your body. You're miserable. So I went, like, health should be an indulgence, right? Like, you should feel like, yeah, I'm just taking this in and it's... It's wonderful. It's wonderful, and it's yes. Not a bad indulgence. It's it's no. a good indulgence, but it's it's not a sacrifice. Well, so right? so that's that's the um, somebody yeah. I forget who forgive me. Um, you you tell well, and you mentioned it about hospital breakfasts, right? I could give you three eggs and bacon, and you're saying this to a diabetes patient, mm -hmm. and you know, <laughs> the the gentleman from Wheeling or someplace out further into the 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 country looks at you and goes, "Yeah, I think I could do that." Um, yeah, yeah. You that's feel not, guilty, right? No, no, it's at all. No, it's an indulgence, but it's, it's indulgence. exactly what you need. It's a good indulgence that they would want to do tomorrow because they'll see a positive response. So mm -hmm. I suggest anything to you or a patient and it doesn't give them a positive response. You know, I suggest for them to run, but if their knee hurts and screaming at them, but they're looking at their Fitbit app and it tells them to run, that's just puts putting pain in their body and it's mm -hmm. not going to, it's going to backfire. So, yeah, so maybe feel... maybe now we can come back to that narrative medicine idea that uh, I mentioned earlier. What is it? How did it work in your life? How does it work in... And, and, and maybe um, I think Dave Feldman talks about the pivotal patient. Certainly you look at people like Dave Unwin and, and whoever that patient was that got him in a moment where he could see and that changed everything so changes everything yeah everything i've learned peter is from my patients right so you learn from your patients then you go back and try to sort out the science so even the when i was traveling around the military you know and those people lost 50 100 pounds kept it off i was like okay that's not, i need to understand that and when i come back to my day job start applying it you know so i've read a ton right you know i mean like no one was doing this stuff. So to be able to go into an academic hospital and suggest to the staff that we can do 10 gram carb per meal diets for our diabetes patients. I showed up the first day when I presented this to our med staff with like 200 papers. <laughs> and I said, look, uh, it's cool. Like, I'm not asking anyone else to do this. If I'm on the hospital service, I take full responsibility, right? Because we'll check their sugar, right? What's the downside? You know, we'll check their sugar. Um, and immediately you see stable. I mean, in the hospital, we basically feed them pancakes and give them a, what, what they call a sliding scale insulin, which is usually reactive and it's a mess. People leave the hospital with worse glucose control than when they entered it because we take control, right? So we feed them the diabetic meal mm. and we give them the insulin at whatever the medical intern decides to do. I mean, no offense to the medical intern, it's just they, they don't know how that individual patient responds. They're just looking at a grid, assuming everyone is insulin sensitive, like one unit of insulin drops you 40 points, but you know, Mr. Jones there in bed three is highly insulin resistant. 10 units doesn't even drop him five, right? Because he's mm -hmm. so resistant. So they don't even understand that. So when, again, back to the rule of small changes. Yeah, so that, you know, that validated for me that feeding less carbohydrate causes less insulin or glucose fluctuation because we would check their sugar right there in the hospital, controlled environment. You know, they can't sneak anything else in. And it was voluntary. You know, I'd go in, Peter, and say, you know, here's an option. You know, we can try this lower carbohydrate diet. You know, we'll feed you adequate amounts of eggs and meat and salads. You know, it's, we're going to give you double servings of all that. You know, it's delicious. We'll check your sugar. You know, how's that sound? And they're like, oh, sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, good news. <laughs> good news. And, uh, you know, I give full credit to my uh, dietitian, Carolyn Segel at the hospital, who was very open-minded. And my kitchen staff, right? Because you got to train the kitchen staff, you know, who are usually like not considered part of the team, but I would go down there after they made a great meal and thank them. And I know them all by first name. And I think they really felt empowered 
you know, if they were bringing in a meal, Peter, because they would come deliver the meal and you'd open it. And if I was in the room and I'd say, oh, my gosh, this is great. And you'd, and you'd kind of do a little quiz with the patient, you know, just or if they came in, like, say, say we hadn't done the diet shift yet. You know, they someone else had ordered the diet and you're just doing rounds and you'd open the lunch tray and you'd quiz them and say, OK, let's talk about what's on this lunch tray. You know, be mashed potatoes. <laughs> How many grams of carbs do you think are in that? You come up with something and then say, okay, well, if it's four ounces, it's probably about, you know, 25 or something, you know, but so you'd, you'd make, you'd start doing that. So it's every time there's a meal is an opportunity to educate. Mm -hmm. And then if they leave knowing more about their diabetes, then when they came in, we've done our job. If they leave with good sugar control, because we decided to control everything for them, that doesn't help them a bit mm -hmm. because they're going to leave and, and go out and do whatever. So the goal is, to try to educate while they're there hmm. and uh, med reduction was part of it you know so now that's a whole kind of field we're working in you know i published a paper with david on when on this but you know the only downside of this is if, if people don't understand the meds if they leave on these big doses of insulin and sulfonylureas which drop blood sugar if they're not eating sugar there's risk of low blood sugar hmm. so if you're listening to this and on diabetes medications talk to your doc because yeah. we don't want you to have a low. Right. And um, this is not medical advice. It's information to help you have, get the information you need to have an informed conversation with your health care mm -hmm. support team. Um, one of us is a medical doctor. The other is not. You can guess but, which you know, one. People, yeah, I mean, it, but it's all good. You know, I think the basics of diabetes, Peter, you know, anyone, like you say, you're crossing channels and talking to people in industry. So I think people selling food, making food, need to understand diabetes. This is, this is, you'll enjoy, this is the text I just got is from my friend, because we're all, we have this meat market called Crestview. <laughs> so it says, any requests from Crestview? It's a Mennonite, it's a Mennonite, um, uh, just old school butcher. So I'm going to reply back because she's going now and say, bacon. <laughs> Let's see, maybe I'll get two packs, two packs. We'll go with Excellent. that. Yeah, I, I don't want to miss the, the opportunity. No, to uh, I that wouldn't... bacon is really good bacon. And the lard off of that bacon, you, you can maybe explain to your audience better than me, but that, that lard is, is like different than like you bought some, you know, farm, uh, you know, the factory grocery store bacon. This is the, the more the free range bacon, but that, that lard is, is good to cook with. Well, or, or maybe it's bacon drippings as opposed to lard, which technical difference, but it's all good. It's um, really good. It, it's <laughs> it a magical substance. Yes. It's magical. It, it's, it's, it's the one way to eat spinach is with a... <laughs> Kids will eat any vegetable if you mix in some bacon, I'm telling you. Yes, yes. It's a magical, magical thing. Magical. Um, so um, we've... You now you work in a smaller clinic that is then part of, or is that the statewide hospital system that has smaller regional units and then yeah, we're the a regional campus for West Virginia University. So our mothership, so to speak, is in Morgantown. It would be kind of like if in your town you had a small rural hospital, but you know, Maine, o, Oregon Health Sciences, OHSU was the mothership. So we're a smaller hospital. My hospital is a 24-bed critical access hospital. It's a very small rural hospital. But they opened up a, a metabolic clinic for us, Peter, be, really because of this awareness. And our dean's an endocrinologist who is very much focused on insulin resistance. So we opened up a clinic that allows me to do this, you know, without being completely uh, discredited. You know, there's certainly opposition out there, but I'm allowed in a clinic to teach mm -hmm. people, you know, an Atkins style diet, you know, eat plants and animals, you know. Not well, plants. yeah. So, so you're definitely a disruptor in the system. Um, one of the things that I remember from the presentation was that in March, um, you had recently um, gotten sugar sweetened beverages removed from the clinic that you the critical care clinic the that hospital. you mm -hmm. worked in um and you were about to go talk to the mothership about doing something similar 
Has there been any progress on that? Yeah, there has been progress. And then we got this little problem called COVID. So oh, yeah. We're, yeah. I had a meeting set up with the Dean of Public Health in Morgantown in March. And uh, we've exchanged a couple emails since then. But like right now, cases are just correct. Like right now, public health has nothing to do with sugar, <laughs> which is kind of sad because I think now is the opportunity you know, I wrote a paper with Nina Teichholz on, you know, is it time to lock down sugar? Because, you know, we we have to build, I mean, the vaccine might come and we can distribute it, but it's an opportunity. Healthy people don't get very sick with COVID. And if you're not that healthy person, this ain't going away, right? Take this opportunity to build your own personal resiliency. It's like, we need to be talking about this um, the, along with making vaccines, you know, so. Sure, like, sure, 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 sure. But, but until that day comes but you know there'll be the next virus so if yeah. you're a healthy person and and anyone can find the data a well person does not end up in the hospital with covid other i mean rare rare exceptions mm -hmm. so I, never, I, never, I, but rare exceptions i, I do point out is not healthy i do point out to folks that it's one of the foundations of animal husbandry that it begins with proper nutrition for the animal, right? You're, you're not going to use the veterinary pharmaceuticals to overcome bad nutrition or bad housing management or stress mm -hmm. on the animals that you can alleviate in some way. And yet we seem to have a different attitude when it comes to humans. Um, and ironically, shortly before, just around the beginning of the year, I began to look into, you know, these, this question about a about metabolic health globally. And one of the things I was becoming aware of was from a policy and program point of view, it seems like they separate infectious and non-infectious diseases and they treat them separately as if they have no relationship when they get to policy and program. Yeah, and they do, you know, communicable and non-communicable diseases. You know, that's kind of how the WHO separates them. But here we have a communicable disease affecting metabolically sick people, you know, on the score of like 50 to one, right? So it's, so they do influence, but yeah, maybe people will start talking about that. Like, and which one can you, can you control more? And you know, it's hard to control a virus like, mm -hmm. as we see, once we identify it, the horse has left the barn, you know, no pun intended there with the animal tribe, but yeah, yeah the chickens are out of the coop. <laughs> the fox is in the hen house. The um, so you've, um, in addition to the the effort to remove sugar sweetened beverages from the critical care hospital, you've also been involved in some other efforts. Uh, I spoke with Adele Height first of all. I spoke with Doug Reynolds. Um, and talked about the clinical guidelines um, yes. for uh, re carbohydrate redu uh, restricted, uh, sorry, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction or reduction. I, I think reduction for the R. Um, and and so it sounds better than restriction. That sounds painful. <laughs> so yes. we always want to keep it positive. You know, this isn't fasting it's it's a intermittent feasting you know someone's time restricted eating you know because like if you, if you use a term that sounds negative <laughs> then yeah they might do it for a week or you know like fast sounds like lent you know which is yeah. sacrifice or ramadan you know yeah you and, and certainly year. we're we're back to that diet thing right that's yeah, a yeah, we don't want period diet. of time and then you go back to the lifestyle that got you to where you were yeah, that you weren't you happy about um, so it's super important I, what Adele took the lead on that one, but you know, this is a medical, this is medical nutrition therapy. So just like any other medical protocol, there has to be guidelines of how to do it correctly. So we're not just shooting from the hip. Mm -hmm. You know, we see people handing out keto food lists, low carb food lists, selling products, you know, the average with the internet, the average consumer there you know, even physician, because we don't learn this in medical school. So, you know, I think a lot of people are starting to understand the carbs and the insulin resistant, but yet they may not understand the medications, you know, so mm -hmm. 
you know, we'll have, you know, clinicians in our own community give out these low carb food lists, but they're afraid, well, someone, I'm not their primary, someone else will adjust the medicines, but you can't tell someone to go low carb if they're on big doses of insulin or these medications called sulfonylureas like glipizide, glucotrol, amaryl, because you will, low blood sugar is life threatening. Well, so, and, and blood pressure as well, right? That yeah, would be yeah, another... you can drop the blood pressure because everything improves. It's, you know, it's not a negative. It's your blood pressure improves. Insulin retains salt and water. So if you're on all these uh, diuretic pills, you know, you're going to become volume depleted. Um, so, so it, you know, it's not rocket science. It's like, you know, any clinical pathway in medicine, we're loaded with clinical pathways, you know, for whatever, you know, whether it's hypertension, right? There's this algorithm of what drug you add first, you know, the lifestyle management, you know, all this stuff. So, so we're just trying to present this as an algorithmic type of um, approach. And we published a, a book uh, through Guideline Central. So this actually sits up on the clinical practice guideline site with Eric Westman, uh, Will Yancey, and Lydia Bazano. So we put out a clinical guideline book on this thing. So much parallel to the Low Carb USA, you know, the basics of all this are the same. We're trying to get it in different places and get it in the mainstream medical literature and mainstream medical guideline places because that's where, I mean, it, it's it's legit if it's sitting in these peer-reviewed places. Mm -hmm. It's not like well, that's those low-carb people over there with their own, you know, tribe. <laughs> it's no. This is this is this is it, right? This is yeah. So like, so. For anyone whose physician wishes to learn more, there are these resources for them to educate themselves about this. We can share some on your notes. So guidelinecentral.com, you know, then there's like a, a link after that, but you can pull up the book. It's like an easy flip book, right? You can view it on your phone. You could download mm -hmm. a PDF, open access, free. Okay. Um, and and it. then also- Wolfhard USA the, has it on right. their site. You know, right. all free, Tim Noakes involved in that, you know, mm -hmm. number of really, you know, esteemed clinicians, you know, people taking care of patients. Yeah, well, or, the I, I call them free living human beings, right? Yes. <laughs> and they're all like, live, you know, there a lot of them came to this from their own health issues. Yes. That's Doctors, the, for the most part, are not healthy people. Apologize, my store phone going here. Someone will grab that outside. It's, it's absolutely fine. Thank you for the time and, and the information. Um, again, I have gotten over the years to, to speak in front of agricultural audiences. And, um, you know, whatever the statistics are for the general public, I think are pretty well represented in the audiences at these meetings. And, and the irony, I think is that for many, they're producing the products that I argue you need to eat more of um, and, and less of the sort of processed food that, that comes. Um, but again, those people are living stressful lives. Those people are, you know, working long hours and um, talk to a gentleman who had been a long haul trucker and you know, the kind of food that's available to them. But even there, we can find food that fits um, if we know that. what to avoid. And so this, this um, low carb for any budget book is, is one that really strikes a, 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 a bell with me because I'm interested in what we can do to get more and more and more people aware of this, apply it, have the results, grow it from the bottom up, because I don't think it's ever going to come from the top down. Oh. Um, and maybe it shouldn't. Maybe that's the problem is somebody said, this is what you should do as if all human beings are the same and respond the same with the same desires. And um, so this this idea of making it mainstream um, and accessible uh, is, is one that really resonates with me. So if you have um, any sort of, um, without, you know, breaking any kind of confidentiality, just sort of ordinary people 
how are they applying this in their lives and the results that they're seeing? If you could share any of those from your presentations, that's been tremendously yeah, impactful. Well, that's the narrative medicine. And I, I didn't make up narrative medicine, Peter. That's like storytelling going back before stone tablets. Right? That's, how, mm -hmm. that's how humans communicate. You know, the stories is how we learn and share knowledge. You know, so narrative medicine is being able to share stories of successful patients. You know, so I've, I've had, uh, for one example, I have a guy who is, uh, his job, his name is, I'll call him Steve, actually is his first name, but um, no, nothing more than that. But he actually fixes, he's a roadside truck repair guy. You know, so he's the guy, like, if you have a Mack truck and something blows and you're stuck on the side of I-5, you know, he's the guy you call 24-7 who will come out and, and crawl under your truck. And uh, he, he was, like, 300-plus pounds and was having all kinds of issues because he's got to, like, fit under things. And uh, his wife um, packs him his lunch, right, because he's just on the road. And uh, he lost, like, 70 or 80 pounds. And his wife always comes to the visits. And uh, she's very, uh, you could tell, like, he's just paying attention to the wife. She's, like, paying attention, taking notes. And, uh, you know, what are you packing him for lunch? Two hard-boiled eggs, a piece of salami, and a little salad. And he's content. And he's doing it, right? Nothing fancy. And he doesn't waver. And he does that. You know, I've got people on, you know, Medicaid and who are on SNAP, which is the, um, we did a grant and shared the narrative of one of our, my patients. He did a little Facebook feed where he's lost about 150 pounds, full disability. He can't even walk or exercise, but he was using, we have, uh, we've had for about six years now grants to double SNAP, which are food stamps. You know, if you don't know what SNAP, it's Supplemental Nutrition Assistant Program, but you can go to a farmer market, swipe your EBT card and you get double bucks back. So 20 bucks becomes 40 bucks. But he would go to the farmer market every week and, you know, you could get cheese, you can get eggs, you can get vegetables, you know, you can get all kinds of farm products. But he was doing that program and he's just to it. He eats two meals a day and it's like, well, what is it this week? What was on sale? He's like, well, this week I just had a hamburger. And uh, so, uh, uh, but his meals are like this. He has two meals a day, non-negotiable. He always has two vegetables and a fat protein, which could be whatever's on sale. Like he'll get whatever, and those are non-starchy vegetables. He always gets the vegetables. You know, he goes to like a save a lot and whatever he can grab there. Um, and then what could be pork chops one week, it could be chicken one week, it could be ground beef one week. You know, maybe if there's something better on sale, he'll grab it, but it's not fancy, but he has two meals a day just like that and um, repeat. And now he could go off the rails any day, right? But, but he knows that he's doing it, he's feeling good and it, when, when does that person, because they're all, they're food addicted, when do they finally have enough control that they can let their guard down a little bit? I don't know that question because I think people are still really vulnerable, you know, especially people, you know, with needs, you know, economic needs and because everyone's a food pusher around them, you know, they're, you know, friends bring them bread and like they run out of money and, and they have stuff in their closet. They have every strike against them to succeed, but somehow well, they do. Yeah. Yeah, how many... I was saying this to someone the other day, you walk into these truck stops and you're assaulted with the smell of cinnamon buns, right? Because yeah, there's so one of those franchises everywhere. Do not now. enter, right? You just look yeah. at that sign. Usually there's a sign in front of truck stops or fast food, you know, where the drive through is, it says, do not enter. So you just have to print that in your brain. Yeah. Do not enter. <laughs> So you were talking, uh, what was it? Uh, um, something in landmines. What was it? Um, well, that's Adam Brown's book. And, you know, I have a little handout in my clinic. So this is our little worksheet every visit. So bright spots, Adam Brown's a type one who has followed Bernstein. His book, you can um, listen to free online. Uh, he narrates it. So a bright spot, Peter, is what's working for you. So everyone seems like in medicine we're always working on the negatives right but i want to hear what so what's what's working for you peter what's what's been good this month what foods do you like tell me about your good days what do you, what's working for you oh i'm liking to walk i got a dog oh yeah like i love the hamburger the bunless hamburger you know i'm making frittatas every week you know i got rid of sugar drinks you know i totally got rid of sugar drinks you know like 
I got a support system. You know, my friends helping me. So you just kind of lit that's bright spots. These are things that are going to keep you on track. Okay. Well now let's talk about the landmines, right? And these are the things that keep blowing up in front of you every day, right? Ah, oh, the bread, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's usually bread, 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 and bread, right? That's like mm -hmm. the biggest landmine, even more than the sugar drinks. There's, I don't know. I, I, there's something about bread that just people have a hard time giving up bread. Mm -hmm. But when they of do, course we've got we got Thanksgiving coming, Christmas, you know, well, if you can gather for the family. Well, even if you can't, that may be even more of a trigger for some of the old comfort foods to, mm -hmm. you know, sort of fill that lack this time this year. Um, and so and, and to also come back to the, the CGMs as a means or even just a ordinary single read glucometer that yeah. you can see how you respond to the food that you are eating, um, regardless of whether you're going to change or not. Let's just see what happens. So let's say we have somebody who's just eating and they're just interested um, what should a fasting glucose reading be? What should a glucose reading be however long after you've eaten a meal? Uh, are there some yeah, there's, guidelines? There's a lot there? of variance to that. So I think that's why you can't just have a fasting glucose and make any sense of the other 24 hours of the day. <laughs> so is, I mean, my fasting sugar is the highest usually in the entire day because you get this morning cortisol response. Um, my sugar will go up when I exercise because my body will make uh, glucose from, you know, it's beta oxidation of fats, right? So you're actually gluconeogenesis, you're making. So you want to, each person wants to kind of self-quantify, you know, it's kind of time and range. Okay, so they want to see, okay, I usually have pancakes for breakfast. So let me see what my responses one, two hours after pancakes. But again, like you take people, are they a well person or a not well person? If it's someone who's pre-diabetic, diabetic, or has central obesity, which is essentially the same thing, then those folks, that's medically important for them to figure that out because their risk of cardiovascular disease, plus all the other plethora of chronic illnesses, it's exponentially going up the worse those conditions get. So we need to see, they need convincing. So even, um, you know, if you check before meals and the CGM, I started using a CGM again, like two years ago, you know, so I would check breakfast. I checked before lunch, check before dinner, maybe random. And they were tended to be okay. But my A1C was still riding up a little above six, which is still not really ideal. And I'd be like, well, my sugars look pretty good. And then these freestyle Libres came out, you know, I got one on my arm now. It's just like a little coin. But then I, you know, and I guess you always kind of let your guard down you, what you don't see you don't really care about but you know it's still have a decent amount of fruit i loved fruit but you know you'd have some fruit with the meal maybe a little starchy veg and your sugar would go up and come down but by the next point in time right like if you have a valley and a valley but you got a mountain between there you know you actually had some elevation gain and loss so then you'd see oh it went up to 200 there you know but it came back down so i think people they need to, to work with somebody. You can do this with a glucometer, you know, just check a lot uh, and see what the data points are showing you and then make a change. Okay, well, let me try to, let me change this. Don't change eight variables. Well, let me reduce the grains and the sugar drinks, right? But keep maybe some of the lentils, you know, peas, starchy veg, you know, because those have better nutrients. They have fiber. They are real food. The bread is not real food. That's just not real food, even if it says whole wheat. And certainly the sugar drinks, even mm -hmm. natural ajwala naked juices, right? They're just yeah. sugar bombs, you know, with yeah. fancy organic labels on them. True. Dried True. fruits, right? Yeah. So dried fruits is just disaster for blood sugar. For anyone yeah. out there who thinks that raisins are healthy for you, you know, maybe for a teenage football player, but yeah. anybody else. But you'll see. The monitors just make it easy. You stick it on for two weeks, stick it on for four weeks, not necessarily a lifetime. And you just, first week, you'd eat the way you usually eat. Assess it. Okay, well, I see these spikes. Well, let me, that'll tell you what you need to change. We just got a grant through Abbott to do a clinical trial with new diabetic, new patients with diabetes with these CGMs. 
basically giving them a book for them to self-quantify. I mean, the holy grail is the clinician can get out of the way. Mm-hmm. It's like the self-driving car, right? We give them this glucometer and little book, and then they can do a little worksheet. Okay, well, you know, connect the dots going backwards. You know, go for a walk. That's powerful to lower blood sugar for someone with diabetes. They assume they just need to shoot insulin, you know, which is going to store it. But you could just go for a walk. Well, my sugar's at 180. It's not horribly high. Let me go. My dog's looking a little anxious in the corner there. <laughs> yeah, go for go for a walk with your dog. Mm-hmm. Go for a bike rides. You know, do something. Get you know, stand at your desk and you know, do some standing now. You know, do some lunges or something. Oh, a natural running page, is that right? Yeah, I have a website called naturalrunningcenter.com. Okay. And I have a book called Run For Your Life, which has a website, runforyourlifebook.com. And there's a research page that has, I've got to upload some more stuff on there, but it's got some of the publications, a lot of videos, a lot of articles about health, running, nutrition, mostly stuff that we filmed here. And uh, Adele was a part of a couple articles that we've worked on together. So she's awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. The company you keep really helps you because we're all bringing in different experience. And I love collaborative papers. You know, you get an RD, get a doc, get a researcher, get a pharmacist. And then, you, you know, that's how you sort it out. Get a patient, <laughs> you know, do a case study, focus it around the patient. Indeed. And it, it's hard to argue when somebody says this is what I did and this is what happened now maybe it won't happen for anybody else but yeah, you have to see explain it. that it's not a paradox yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah Tim Noakes explain you know the way he describes it that's not a paradox like the French paradox why do they have like very low heart disease and they eat butter and cheese and they actually smoke more than anywhere in Europe okay we have to explain that Maybe oh. they're just not stressed out. I, I don't know, but but that's not a paradox. It's, yeah. it's an explanation. Oh, but it's something. the antioxidants and the red wine. That must yeah, be it. it. Must be it. But even the ones, why are the children healthier? <laughs> Maybe they're starting to drink the wine earlier. They it drink good it. Wine. I, I would take the fr- French wine. Above yeah. Almost yeah. Above. You guys got nice wine in Oregon. I really like your. Yeah, so I've been told. Uh, it's not something that's on my personal menu, but. Um, <laughs> There's my glass a day. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, you're a doctor, so you can do that. Um, <laughs> I know you, you cherry pick your literature. I love the articles, red wine, good for you. Okay, I'll, I'll keep that one, and then you might come across one oh, alcohol, like, oh, that's a bullshit article. Right? <laughs> yeah. We all cherry pick what yeah. we like. Well, I um, coffee good for you, right? I'll yeah, right, those. exactly. Bring, bring, bring yeah. all those articles, and I'll ignore the one that says coffee bad, and coffee right, exactly. Cause brain damage or something. Um. So let's see. Oh, two river. So Shepherdstown. Um. I know quite a few people from that part of the world. So um, I'll I'll try to direct them your way so that maybe they can uh, benefit they from... come into our store it's a yeah. small retail and we're fighting the good fight with covid trying to stay open and getting grants and loans <laughs> kicking mm. the kicking the can down the road as far as you know yeah paying so, all the bills off you are are have you kept your streak alive of sub three hour marathons No, I ended that a couple years ago. Uh, So there's the year the Boston Marathon was like the most horrendous conditions. 2018, there was, you know, 50 mile an hour headwinds. They're about to cancel the race. And and I was fit and ready to roll and and ended up like the the women's winning time was like 240 high, Hmm. like 242, 243. You know, it's usually one in like 222. So, I mean, people were like exponential and I, I ran a 304 that year so and I was I was I was holding on and but you just got so cold and so I gave it a go but that's that's fine I, I'm kind of I'm, I'm enjoying other I, like I like you know trying to race these marathons and I was 30 years of you know running marathons under three hours and you have to stay healthy I think that you know the main you know kind of principle of that it's not about running fast is you got to be a healthy person to be able to, to show up at the starting line and be able to do that, right? You can't be metabolically sick or injured. So, you know, I just 
if you stay healthy, you're going to do okay. But I love trail running now, especially with, with COVID. I mean, all the big races are canceled. So now, you know, you can still do these uh, small trail races. You know, I just mm -hmm. finished a week ago my first 100-mile trail race, appropriately socially distanced. We had 200 people spread out over 100 miles of trail. So I think it was probably <laughs> in the New River Gorge. I think it was safer than Food Lion or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. Lowe's or Home Depot's. I felt pretty safe out there that I wasn't wow. going to. Have How long does it take you to run 100 miles? Yeah, so that took me 31 hours because uh, it's a lot of hiking because it's it's climbing and going in and you know, most of it's trail. You know, but I just wanted to finish, you know, so my first, that was my goal was finish. 32 hours was the window. You had to finish 32 hours, finished in 31.30, alive. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are people doing this in under 24, but like I, the thought of racing 100 miles, I just like want to keep forward motion. It's like the cattle migration, just keep going. But well, and some of experience. that's dark, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it gets dark at five o'clock, you know, so. And running yeah, hard in the dark. Yeah, I'm but sorry? still running hard in the dark sounds like, yeah, you know, at something. Night could I happen. basically, um, you know, power hiked in the dark, you know, just yeah. try to. Because the Rudy trails, you know, if you try to run, you'll like you'll just step on. Like as soon as you try that, you end up whacking your toe against something. Like, okay, or or risk benefits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it. Um, I'm uncoordinated too at 54, and my, my night vision is not good. So I did, I went like running. You have two feet in the air. Mm -hmm. So walking, you have at least one foot on the ground at all times. So I like the stability of walking at night mm -hmm. on a trail. But at least yes. I have one foot on the ground mm. at all times. So um, let's see. Um, we're just about to the time. Um, how, and again, maybe it's an agronomist's perspective on things. Uh, which may not be appropriate for humans, but if if you found if you had a way to tell some information to so so I was reading something the other day that said you know decisions always precede actions you know we we make a decision before we take any action and we may not be aware that we made the decision but we did. And prior to that decision is some information. Now the information may be good or bad, but it then gets us to the point of making a decision. Then we take some action. Hopefully we see some results because it was good information. We took the appropriate action. Um, and then if that is positive, then that creates sort of momentum forward. Yeah. What sorts of, so we've talked a lot about what, can work but why would someone what would be you had the moment when you saw the c peptide uh result and that triggered some information but if somebody hasn't yet been to the doctor with a test uh, just to sort of summarize the things that or maybe they have and they're not going back because they've the tests haven't been good. Um, what sorts of things might trigger someone to look further into this as a possible course of action? So we've talked about um, waist circumference. Yeah, yeah, I think any, it's a great question. And I think lack of awareness. So the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance Pre-diabetes, I mean, like my state, probably 70 to 80 percent of people, you know, have that almost full blown. I mean, that UNC uh, article a couple years ago said 12 percent of the people in our country is met are metabolically well. I'm waiting for a day when I pull up the labs of someone who has pre-diabetes that they actually know they have pre-diabetes. Most of them don't even know they have it, even though it's right there. Most of it, like I say, you know, this thing of the metabolic syndrome, do you know what that is? And they look at you like you got two heads and you pull up their labs, you know, their triglycerides are 300, their HDL is 30, you know, they've got hypertension, they're on three meds, you know, they're on a lipid med, you know, they've got a 46 inch waist, and they're pre-diabetic, but they don't know it. So if you don't know it, you can't act on it. You know, if you know it, like Sun Shu, the art of war, know thy enemy, you know, then you can, but 
you know, if you can get people to understand it first, Peter, that's the first thing, just in, in plain language, you know, I just scribble on the back of a napkin. You know, if I can't explain it to someone on the back of a napkin, you know, we might as well get out of the room. Mm -hmm. And then you go have them just observe a little bit about what they're doing, prepare, right? You said, you know, you have to, you know, make a decision before you act, you know, so you're observing, you prepare, you prepare your mind, shop, clean the ca cabinets out. And then you have your action, then you do it. So they, there's a stepwise process of getting someone prepared to take this on because you can't half take it on. Mm -hmm. Either take it on or you don't because insulin is a storage hormone. It's anti-catabolic. And there's a certain threshold for each person that if it's above that threshold, you're still not able to mobilize your fat. Some people need really hard lockdown. You know, but, oh, that's extreme, right? I mean, Eric Westman is right. You know, that induction phase, if people are willing to do it, you know, I believe that's going to help them just feel it and get that positive response, right? If I ask you to do something, it gives you a negative response. You're not going to want to keep doing it. Or but if you I can't ask you to notice, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's giving you a wonderful positive response, which wouldn't be in one day. You tell them, okay, you got to wait five, seven days. And then they get a positive response. But some people do really need convincing that, look, just do, just give us two weeks, do this hard lockdown, you know, but you got to be prepared. Don't do it uh, if you're in the most stressful deadline situation at work, right? There's time, you know, holidays and, you know, your family strife and whatever. Like there's a time to start this and there's a time not to start it. You know, say you're taking care of a sick family member, a relationship problem, kids overdose, right? Like, like that's not like your cortisol is also a storage hormone and a growth hormone. So we talk about insulin a lot, but we can't forget cortisol. So someone's cortisol is off the rails, sleep apnea. So we have to, that's why people do need help. You know, I think mm -hmm. people early in it can maybe self-guide their way out. But when people are really far down this road, you know, they need support. They need help from someone who can figure out which are the levers to work on. Well, thanks for being one of the people that are helping more people understand what those levers are and, and, and what happens when you manipulate them and what is possible, right? I mean, if, if people didn't think it was possible, then why, why would you even start yeah. having demonstrated? If, if you do not believe you can get better, what are your odds of getting better? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like there, there, if you believe you can get better, at least you got a scream and chance. Right? Yeah. So finish there's, the there's, marathon, right? If you don't believe you're going to finish, yeah. you know, yeah, you don't even line up. But at least there's, if you believe you can finish, you can finish the damn thing. There's one universally true statement. It's true everywhere it's said, every time it's said, and that is it won't work here. <laughs> and if yeah, you have like it, to shut that off. Yeah, if you have anything to do with it, you're absolutely right. It won't work where you are. It won't work here. We don't do that here. That's yeah, not how we do it here. Yeah. Or or the other one, the, the what's oh, the we don't believe most, that that low carb thing here. That's stuff. Yeah, that most that dangerous statement. We've always done it this way. Yeah. Yeah. So. Things are like Lustig explains it pretty well, Robert Lustig. He thinks we're at about year eight of 30 years before. Mm. And he says it pretty straight out. He, you know, he honestly comes out and says, look, we just have to wait for all the, you know, eminent older clinicians who are not flexible in their thinking, you know, and willing to take on new ideas. You just have to wait for them all to retire. Mm -hmm. But you well, remember, we used, to, yeah, we used to be able to smoke on airplanes. Yes. And, and in the hospitals, I remember my early VA rounds you know, as a medical student in the you know, rural Virginia. There's this, mm. they, they were able to smoke in their own rooms, not even a smoking room, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's hopefully, out. yeah, the, 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 there are models for change. Thank you for being a disruptor. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. And, uh, yeah, um, I encourage people to to look more. Um, I'll post a link to the the low I'll carb. I'll send you the links to the guidelines that people can print out. Perfect, perfect. And the book, we can share the book too at the same link I, I sent you. So you could share that link. It's fine. Absolutely. It's
free download. <laughs> Share yeah. it out. F- free is a good price. Yeah, uh, I'll be sure to do that. Money. So like the more traction we can get from grant money to get to more people helps Perfect. us get more grant money. <laughs> Maybe, you know, you can say, gosh, you know, 80,000 people read this book, you know, like it's been downloaded blank number of times, you know, that's what I want. Good. Let's see what we can do to increase the chances of getting more grant money. Okay. All right. Well, have a great day out there in Oregon, or it's early afternoon where you are. It's getting dark here. So, yes. <laughs> Heck yeah. Um, dinner time coming soon. That bacon may be showing up. So, I'll let yes, you get to I, it. I don't know if I'm going to cook it tonight or, you know, bacon is really for any meal of the day. Oh, like, absolutely. At nighttime, you can cooking up some bacon with some kale and some onion. Oh, maybe throw an egg on there. It's mm. delicious. That's mm. just like nutrient density, you know, yeah, diet food. Food. so it's not about carbs or protein. It's the density, nutrient density of the foods. And then you're not hungry. There's that creates satiety. Mm-hmm. It's really nutrient dense foods. Yeah, we can get back together again and talk about protein, but that's for another day. Right on. No, glad be glad to come back on again. You know, I learned from you too in our little listserv group. Yes. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, Peter. Bye-bye.